Okay. Excellent. So uh, Sabre's excited uh, for the first time in conference history. We have a uh, we have a group of student presentations as part of our uh, research presentations, and uh, and this group, which uh, features students but is not exclusively students, uh, <laughs> is uh, is the first in that triplet of research presentations at this year's conference, uh, and so I'm excited to feature that for the first time this year and excited for, uh, for this group to uh, kick us off. So go ahead, fellas, thank you. Go ahead. Hi, uh, hi uh, I'm Gregory Dvorak. I'm a, a junior at Wake Forest and I'm from Dallas, Texas. So a couple years ago, um, before Rangers game, I attended a uh, Sabre 101 info session uh, taught by Dr. Camp. I live a few blocks from SMU, so I decided to contact him and uh, see if he needed any help on a project or something. I had no idea that uh, I'd be presenting with him at the uh, Sabre conference uh, at any point. Great. Uh, yeah, so I'm Joe Camp, and uh, I'm a professor at SMU, and um, I, uh, I pulled in Gregory, but I also uh, had through a chat with the athletic, I don't know if the email remembers this, but he, I had asked him with the power of machine learning, what questions would you, uh, would you ask? And so that led to this research. And so um, I'm really excited to be working with both of them. And I especially want to uh, accentuate how vital Gregory has been to us in our research, because um, we ask Gregory to do something and he just goes and does it. And, and he figures out how to do it. And we have the big ideas, but he has been implementing pretty much this whole effort. So kudos to Gregory. Do you, you want to uh, share the slides? Yeah. Eno, did you want to say anything? Oh, just want to say hi. Uh, my name is Eno Saris. I'm actually the athletic. I remember that question in the chat. And it's always been interesting to me to think about, uh, you know, are there, you know, 25 million pitches, you know, because there's, there's just as many pitches as there are pitchers that throw them. Um, or are there nine pitches like we've decided? Like, are there only sort of fastball, slider, curve? Um, and uh, early on, we found that people were kind of right. Uh, Greg will take you through it. Uh, but we did find a bunch of interesting stuff uh, once we started digging into it a little bit more. So I just want to uh, start with the big picture, and then Gregory will take it from there. So the big picture is we essentially are asking uh, if, if a pitcher throws – two different pitches in their arsenal, we call that a pairing. It doesn't matter if it's before or after or any time at that point during the season, uh, a pitcher throws something uh, in another pitch, those two pitches we say are paired. And so the question, the essence of the question is, does one pitch in isolation versus one pitch paired with another pitch have better or worse performance? And so that's what we call effective pairings. And then we also identify some ineffective pairings. So uh, we are going to, uh, to, as the course of the, uh, over the course of the presentation, we're gonna motivate uh, what led to this subtype classification and the methodology we use. So we used MLB StatCast data uh, for all pitches thrown from 2016 to 2017. And then we'll, we'll tell you about the resulting subtypes we had from this clustering. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the dimensionality, the physical dimensions of these uh, subtypes that, that manifest from our clustering, and then talk about how we actually pair. How do we look for these arsenal uh, pairings and um, evaluate their better or worse pairings and show those. And then we'll get into some examples of pitchers. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Gregory. So first, uh, we wanted to use machine learning to see if we could find new pitch types. Um, and, but in that process, we realized that the MLB and StatCast already does a good job with that. And we kept uh, only finding the nine major pitch types that they have classified. As, uh, as Eno said earlier, we knew that there were more um, than just those nine. Um, so we decided to continue the machine learning process. So um, why pitch subtypes? We realized uh, in, in the, this Lance McCullers video, he, he shows, uh, 
he shows the same grip and uses a different arm action to vary the movement in, in his knuckle curve. Um, and he's, and we were wondering if he had uh, multiple knuckle curves, how many would exist throughout baseball? Um, and uh, Junior uh, pitching coach Jeff Getz. He was the fifth or sixth overall pick in '97 draft. He was our pitching coach in high school. He threw his like this. So he had the knuckle tucked in, with the middle finger here, and, and the thumb on the bottom. But my hands are as big as it needs to be for that kind of pitch. So I'm, I'm messing around with it, not really feeling very comfortable. And so I kind of went from tucking my nail, to just placing my nail right in the center. And that gave me a lot more ability to feel the pressure in my middle finger on the seam. And it may be able to kind of create different angles, different shapes. Two, two. And hold up on that breaking ball down to the end. Swing and a miss. Struck him out of the third ball. Get going and that finally got his man. When you throw it, are you trying to come over the top? You have to find what works for you. If you throw from down here, you throw from up here, you throw from right over the top. You gotta have a different grip than a Chris Sell. This slider is different. If you throw from down here, you're gonna have a different grip. Like Justin Matchton used to. That's totally side arm, but no big deal. You're gonna have a different grip than Clayton Kershaw does. So big overhand, Uncle Charlie. So for me, it's about finding your grip. So when I found mine that, that fit with my arm angle, I literally drop my hands just like a heater. I grab that curveball, I release it. Same exact motion. I get up here, I stay on top of that ball with middle finger. I want, I want it to. I want to get this motion out of my hand and throw it just like a, just like I would here and let my hand naturally pronate. But this finger is, is still on. This is the guy. Ball. This is the, this is the guy. This middle finger yeah. is it's gonna guide where it goes. Here's the O2. Swing and a miss. Dutch goes down on the curveball. So you're not throwing the same curveball every time. I'm not throwing the same curveball every time. Same grip. Same arm motion, but I'm able to. So I've thrown it a lot. You know, I, this is how I survived a lot of years in the minor leagues when my fastball command wasn't as good before I had to change up. I have a new relationship with my curveball. ball. You know, we've, been, we've been together for a long time. Well, that's the colors. Hey. If uh, we were wondering that if he could, if he could even can, um, have a consistent grip and arm action and still be able to vary his knuckle curve. We were wondering how pitchers could do that with um, uh, the, the other pitch types and how many subtypes would exist uh, throughout, throughout baseball. Junior. Um, so to do this, we did, uh, we did clustering for uh, the values of X break, Y break, velocity, and spin for each of the nine pitch types for lefties and righties. Um, and that first led the pitch types to be clustered by spin, since spin is a much, uh, is a much larger unit. Um, and then we decided to scale the values uh, to fix that problem. And then we used uh, K-means clustering where K is the number of groups of your data, starting at one, where you have an error from all the data points to, to that centroid. When you keep adding, uh, increasing K, we, we uh, simulated from one to 25. When you keep increasing K, the error between all your points in each of the, the centers will go down. And by, do, by using the elbow method, um, that allows us to find the number of centroids where the amount of error has a point of diminishing return. And take, for example, the right-handed change-ups um, where we settled on four. As you can see with the inflection point here being about four where the, the amount of error after that ha has, has minimal change. Um, and with that, the, for example, with the change-up, the the break in the pitches was similar, uh, but the spin was very different for the uh, first two examples, and the break was similar for the last two, but the velocity was different. And we ran that process for all all pitch types for lefties and righties, and we ended up finding thirty subtypes 
for each lefties and righties, which with most uh, pitch types having three or four, the same for each, uh, except for left-handed splitters, which had an additional uh, subtype and the right-handed change-ups, which had an additional subtype. Um, when we were looking at, at the change-ups initial, initially, and we found that one of them had a um, less horizontal break, and I, I was looking for the reasons why for that, and I found an old uh, article by Eno that um, showed that uh, showed that uh, Martin that uh, Carlos Martinez had a uh, and a couple other pitchers had a, a different grip that um, led to a, a different amount of horizontal break, um, and that we found that uh, Pedro Martinez had taught him and uh, Luis Castillo over the off season one year um, how to improve their change up. And so I'm gonna talk about the shape and differences between the physical dimensions of these pitches. So what I'm doing here, what we're doing here is on the X axis, we'll have velocity and on the white axis, we'll have spin. On the top, it's left-handed pitchers and on the bottom, it's right-handed pitchers. So by and large, you see very similar shapes like with the blue and with the magenta and the gray and the red, there are similar shapes. In other words, there are similar subtypes in these two dimensions, spin and velocity. Um, but I've, uh, what we, we've done is identified the additional pitch that we showed in the previous slide. We had this additional splitter. So uh, you see that the shape that was, uh, that was from the right-handers is a little bit different, is very different than the shape that's formed by the left-handers. And we have this additional data point that has higher spin um, and similar velocity as the other pitches. Uh, in addition, we have this additional changeup that uh, Gregor was talking about, uh, where it has uh, the, 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 the lower uh, velocity, but it has a similar spin as a higher velocity pitch, with, which is, um, is kind of a unique thing for if you, if you guys know about Bauer units, uh, that usually matches the velocity and spin are kind of correlated with each other. So it's interesting that the lower velocity has higher, has much uh, of a higher, as high of a spin as a higher velocity pitch. So where we see some departures, even though there's the same number of so total subtypes is with this uh, knuckle curve, the yellow, that we don't have this triangle shape that we have with left-handers, but we have this triangle in addition, uh, we have a, a subtype out here that is not present, even though the same number of subtypes exist. This shape is different than uh, the shape of the left-handers. And we have a higher higher spin, higher speed uh, knuckle curve that's resulting on the right-hand side uh, than the left. And the only other uh, thing we'll point out is that the, the only real major difference in terms of spin that we observe is with the slider, that the slider can have a very large uh, difference on the y-axis. And so you see that with the orange here, that there's a very large diversity where we don't see that really with the other types. Uh, by and large. The other dimensions that we point to are the horizontal and the vertical break. So I have the lefties on the left and the righties on the right. Um, so what you'll observe here is if you reference yourself from a catcher view of the strike zone, uh, we have a positive x-axis from the release point of a left-hander and a negative uh, uh, x-axis on the release point of the right-hander. So uh, the positive break um, is happening uh, for, um, uh, so, so yeah, so, so that's the, the release point. And then what you'll notice is the vertical movement uh, is very, uh, the vertical um, differences are very marginal. That in fact, that these subtypes are kind of concentrated in terms of their vertical movement. But where we see some diversity at least is in the X movement plane. So we have greater levels of diversity in our horizontal movement plane. And so that this is a four dimensional problem. So we tried to slice it in two different dimensions on two different graphs so, to show you uh, these four dimensions. And this led to um, uh, asking, well, 
what do these differences in dimensions, how do they play into whether a pitch is good or not? And so we know that there's different ways a pitcher can be successful. Obviously the holy grail is swinging strike rate, swinging strike percentage. Um, and so swing strike percentage is just out of the total number of, of pitches thrown, um, how many of those get, um, get whiffs as a percentage. And then exit velocity, the, when batters do make contact, what is their miles per hour off the bat? And then we know that pop-ups, um, like infield pop flies and ground balls are very good um, in terms of getting out. So we evaluated that as well. So we had two metrics of just a launch angle off the bat of greater than 40 and a launch angle off the bat of less than zero. So how we paired these pitches, again, a pairing just means that it exists in a pitcher's arsenal. So we looked for any pitcher who had two different pitches that we were evaluating in their arsenal. But first, before we did that, we had a reference point of every one of these subtypes. So remember that Gregory mentioned that we had a total of 30. It just so happened that we had a total of 30 on left, on left for left-handed pitchers and a total of 30 for right-handed pitchers. For each one of those 30, we looked at them in isolation. In other words, we looked at all change up ones and we evaluated them for swinging strike rate, exit velocity, pop-up rate, and grounders. Um, so if you take the reference point of the two-seamer three, uh, you have in isolation for all uh, two-seamer threes that were thrown in 2016 and 2017, we have on average a swinging strike rate of 5.8%, uh, exit velocity 82 mile per hour, a pop-up rate of about 15% and a ground rate of about 34%. So we, we looked for all pitchers that threw this two-seamer three, and we said, okay, what's the, if, if they have a two-seamer three and a change of one, for example, uh, what, what that, does that do? Does it improve the performance or does it take away from the performance of the average that we're seeing here for all two-seamer threes? And what we found was for this one pitch, the two-seamer three, for example, uh, we found that the best pairing in terms of swing strike rate was the sinker two. It actually increased the swing strike rate by 3.2%. Conversely, a curveball three, when thrown with a two-seamer three, the two-seamer three had a loss in swing strike rate. Again, these are the performance of that two-seamer three, but when paired with another pitch like a curveball three. And so the exit velocity, the best pairing for that in terms of diminishing exit velocity for the two seamer three was when a, a pitcher also threw a sinker three. Conversely, we had some losses uh, when a cutter two was thrown with the two seamer three. And then we had a pop-up rate uh, that was improved by throwing a knuckle curve two with a two seamer three and a ground ball rate improvement with a slider four. Conversely, um, the slider four also uh, took away from pop-up rate, um, but the knuckle curve one had made the two-seamer three have a lot more, uh, a lot less ground balls, that, that their ground ball rate went down. So um, we found, we, we've found the uh, best pairings um, for uh, righties and lefties. Um, here are some of the more notable um, pairing combinations. Um, the curveball one and the knuckle curve two was uh, very beneficial for um, uh, increasing pop-up rate and the change up three and the splitter one was uh, beneficial uh, for, for increasing pop-up rate. Um, the knuckle curve one and the splitter three was very beneficial for uh, improving the swinging strike rate. Um, and for example, the cur that curveball one and, and sinker three pairing, it was very good for, for uh, swinging strike rate. Uh, Aaron Nola over the 2016, 17 seasons, uh, swing strike rate with that curveball one was 17.72%, uh, which is more than 7% better than the other curveball ones, um, which may be attributed to uh, having that sinker three in his, in his arsenal. And 
these, we did the same thing for lefties where the sinker three and the cutter two was uh, very beneficial for ground ball rate. Um, but most notably, not notably for the lefties, the curveball three or the curveball two with the sinker three was uh, very helpful uh, for pitchers um, with both the swing strike rate uh, and exit velo. Um, and the, that curveball two sinker three pairing was um, uh, heavily utilized by John Lester. Uh, who, who had a 28% uh, swing strike rate um, with his cur curveball two, which was 15 percentage points higher than um, other curveball twos over those two seasons. We did this same thing for um, the worst pairings with the knuckle curve four and slider three being a very weak pairing for righties for uh, swing strike rate, exit velo, and uh, ground ball rate. Um, that was a combination uh, thrown frequently by Jeff Samarja. Um, and Eno will talk about uh, Samarja more in depth later. Um, and with the lefties, the two seamer two and the knuckle curve two, um, reduced uh, ground ball rate a lot. Um, and <coughs> while, uh, while not on the table, the change up three and knuckle cur curve four was uh, not good for swing strike rate, especially with Matt Moore, who's, who was about, his change up three was about 1.8% lower than the other change up threes, um, which is which could be surprising considering he, he had a, a good cur curveball and good change up uh, separately at the time, but having both in his arsenal um, was not successful. Uh, one of the reasons I really like uh, this method is that it deals with pitches that the pitchers actually currently throw. So if you come to a pitcher and you say, hey, we would want you to add more horizontal break or more vertical break, um, you don't know that they've necessarily thrown pitches like that. But with this one, for example, you've got Aaron Nola. He throws both the curveball one and the curveball three with the sinker three. But from this research, you can say, hey, the curveball three is better for you. It gets you more swinging strikes. We know you throw the curveball three, uh, and so you can do – is show him this video of his curveball one that has less horizontal break and it's slower. Um, I don't know if we can show the video. Fox walked 58 all of last year. Home runs are up a little bit. He's got that and counts three and two. And he's got that on a three one count. It was like a 78 mile an hour curveball uh, with not a lot of uh, horizontal break. Then you can show him this curveball three. Chase that one, and Acuna has 17 straight games with at least one strikeout. So that that was a, a pitch that Aaron Nola throws. And so you can basically, in a pitch session, say, we want it to look a little bit more like that. We want it to be a little bit more 81-82. Uh, we want it to have more horizontal break. Uh, we know that pairs with your sinker three better. Um, and it could be as simple as you don't have to tell Aaron Nola all this. You can just, when it looks like it does, um, you know, when, the, when it's a curveball three, you can say, attaboy. Uh, that's that's what we're looking for out of that curveball. Um, it also works with bad pairings. Um, I know that Jeff Samarja um, has been working on his curveball. Like basically every spring uh, that I talk to Jeff Samarja, he's working on his curveball. And so I think I don't think he would be surprised to have uh, someone come to him and say, but let's think about uh, the best curveball for your slider. And so for him, he throws the slider three. Uh, that's that's probably one of his better pitches. Um, the, the kind of pitch that works uh, with a slider three, um, the kind of curveball that works with a slider three that he's thrown before is the knuckle curve one. And so here's, uh, you can show him something like this. This is the knuckle curve one. Uh, it's a little bit deeper, um, and that might be one that could, that could work for him. 
given his slider? Tipped into the glove of Posey and then struck. So there's a, a way for for people to make this uh, an actual uh, a, 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 a coaching tool, but you know I think it could also be used uh, for scouting. Um, for example, Aaron Bummer, um, you know he has he's had you know not the greatest results for two seasons, and then last year was amazing. Um, and what you might look when you look at combinations, his sinker three, which we all know is a great pitch. Um, actually combined really well with his fastball one uh, for, for swinging strikes. And last year, what he did was he threw more of the sinkers, um, you know, he threw more of the sinkers low and then used the fastballs high for whiffs. Um, so you could either say, well, hey, that's why they signed him a five-year, $60 billion you know, deal. They're like, we believe that this is working. But you can also, uh, you know, say that to scouts like, hey, if you've seen someone with a sinker like this and this four seamer doesn't look amazing, this is a good combo. So you can look at Aaron Bummer's sinker uh, and how he how he uses it. Three ground outs to strike out, two line outs. Use that low establish inside. You see all those uh, those pitches inside there, uh, and then uh, how he can use the fastball, the four seam fastball, which is not necessarily strength, but uh, he can use the four seam fastball. For whiffs. One more. I don't have the mouse. That was not working? Oh. Yeah, sorry. Two two. So in the same place, uh, the guy thought it was a sinker and he swung under it. Um, so it's uh, you can be reused in sequencing, uh, but uh, we just wanted to know that, like, you know, if you're scouting kids, you could say, hey, even if the other stuff is not great, if they can uh, play off the fastball one and the sinker three in this way, uh, that's proven to have success. Um, so, you know, it, obviously the White Sox use a little bit of that thinking when they signed that extension. Um, so overall, we did realize that subtype pairings in the arsenal can be beneficial. Um, and for both lefties and righties, um, we realized that we found that uh, large differences in vertical break are good for improving pop-up rate, but um, they, they do tend to decrease uh, ground balls. Um, and when off-speed pitchers are your um, reference pitch, uh, if you want to reduce, if you want to uh, reduce contact or reduce harder contact, um, pairing it with pitches that have uh, a large difference in horizontal break is helpful. And um, with, most notably with righties, uh, off-speed pitches. Um, when paired with pitches uh, that, that, that uh, have different velocities um, are, are good for a swinging strike rate. And um, for lefties, fastballs have the opposite effect. Um, with lefties, um, when it comes to a greater velocity margin and swinging strike rate, um, in future work, we plan to use machine learning to better see these relationships um, and possibly look at more recent, the look closer at the 2019 season. Um, and I think I'm, I plan to apply this um, cluster process to uh, ACC college baseball data for the last four seasons to see if I can find anything similar um, and I'd like to thank Dr. Camp and Eno Saris a lot for this, uh, the opportunity to work on this research project and uh, present here. Thank you. Yeah, so we see a couple questions coming in the YouTube chat. Um, I think those are directed to us, the last two. Um, and, uh, and it says, 
why are we why do we care about um, measuring spin rate anyway? What makes us care about that? Um, and so I think uh, in terms of from just from reference of this study, and then I'll let Eno say more about spin rate. Um, but from reference of this study, we wanted to basically see if it had an impact on uh, subtypes and if subtypes were created across um, because of spin rate. And that's why we included it in our analysis. Um, and in general, when you look at the, uh, the movement uh, that happens, this is from another resource, but in terms of what happens with spin and why it is meaningful. Uh, the, the horizontal spin and the vertical spin have differences in, in drag that result, and that creates uh, horizontal and vertical movement. And when you have a reference point, the reference point is actually from this gyro uh, ball. And that's just imagine like a football that's being thrown as a spiral or a bullet that's being coming out of a gun. They're all, they're both doing a spiral. And that's because it's keeping its um, its path, and that's and that's what the comparison point is. So anything from our X break and Y break are all in reference to this spiral ball, um, or a bullet, or a, a, a football being thrown. Um, and whatever naturally would happen with uh, physics in terms of gravity that is induced on the ball, that would be taken into account with the gyro ball. And so additional um, spin in the vertical or horizontal movement is going to um, pull the ball up and down for vertical or side to side uh, with horizontal. Um, and that's going to have an impact on these uh, X and Y break numbers that we show in the, in the next slide. Um, but anything you want to add to why spin is important, you know? I think it's a good question because we're not always sure that spin by itself um, matters. Uh, because we're talking about there's resulting movement from spin. So maybe spin just creates the movement and the movement is what, um, what is so successful. But I would say that I don't think that we figured everything out about spin yet. Um, because of gyro spin in particular on sliders, there's a lot of spin that doesn't contribute to movement but may still be meaningful. Um, and there's also, uh, because of the way spin is conserved over the flight of the, uh, of the ball, I believe that uh, high spin pitches may have more late movement uh, than low spin pitches. Um, and that, I don't think I've seen that modeled. Um, I, I've seen some references to that in, some, in other people's work that uh, I'm not sure if it is, uh, we know exactly how important it is yet. So I think spin by itself can be important. I don't know that we nailed down. So we wanted to see how important it was. As you saw from the results, um, it didn't seem to drive a lot of the large differences in swing strike rate or ground ball differences. Um, it, that was more reduced. That was like velocity differential and movement differential. Um, but uh, I think you're, it's a good question. Uh, and I would say, I don't think we figured everything out about spin, especially when it comes to sliders. Yeah. 